But the um, but uh, despite his thunderous arrogance, he, uh, he he did have the humility to say, you know, there are two things left in the universe that I feel that I don't understand. And one of them is the ultraviolet catastrophe. Now, the ultraviolet catastrophe, the resolution of this dilemma, which you'll study more in 4C, if you haven't already taken 4C. Those of you who have taken 4C, did you study the ultraviolet catastrophe? I hope so. Um, but the resolution of the ultraviolet catastrophe was realizing that light is quantized, realizing that photons exist, which nobody had known until then. Um, the re Lord Kelvin's other thing that he uh, admitted he still didn't understand was the Michelson-Morley experiment, was the fact that light could uh, somehow be measured to travel the same speed regardless of who was doing the measurement. And he said, once we get those two small details out of the way, then there will be nothing left to do but measure to more and more decimal places. Well, again, um, if Lord Kelvin was going to admit there were two small details he still didn't understand, I got to say he picked his two small details well. The ultraviolet catastrophe, again, the resolution to it would lead to the discovery of quantum mechanics. The Michelson-Morley experiment, the resolution to that would lead to the discovery of relativity. And with that, we were off and running saying, holy shit, we actually didn't understand a damn thing. There's, uh, there, there's way more to the universe than we had realized. And the, uh, the history of physics in the 20th century would be, would be launched from there. So, um, so I guess what I'm saying is, yes, historically, that distinction between emotional EMF and induced EMF was a really important one. For practical problem-solving purposes, it's actually not. And the fact that it's not, the fact that you get the right answer either way, was actually a huge clue that Einstein picked up on. Yes? Um, is the Michelson Morley experiment a fault experiment? No, it was an actual physical experiment. They were trying to measure discrepancies in the speed of light in order to figure out how quickly the Earth was moving through the universe, or how quickly our solar system was moving through the universe. They figured if our whole solar system's moving that way at, say, 1% the speed of light, then if we measure a light beam going this way that we're moving head on into, it should seem to be going a little bit faster than the speed of light. And if we measure a light beam that's overtaking us, it should seem to be going a little bit slower than the speed of light. That's what Michelson and Morley expected. That was not what they got. What they got was, no, no matter which direction the light beam is going, it's um, you always measure it to be going the same speed. Which I guess you could take to mean, well, maybe our solar system's at rest with respect to the, uh, the background of the universe. Except that as the Earth orbits the sun, you should be getting different, you know, light speed discrepancies at different times of the year. And the Michelson-Morley experiment was sensitive enough that even if the solar system as a whole is at rest, they should have picked up results that would you know, vary with season as the Earth orbited the sun. And they still didn't. They still found that no matter you know, where the Earth is in its orbit around the sun, if you measure the speed of a light beam, it always seems to be going three times 10 to the eighth meters per second with respect to your lab, not with respect to some you know, background ether or something that fills the universe. Yes? If this phenomenon does not exist in our universe, does this mean that based on our speed of our traveling, as we will see light kind of shifted? We can still see a shift to the frequency of light. We can still see a Doppler shift. And in fact, when you look at the cosmic microwave background, which is kind of the oldest light that fills the universe, we are moving with respect to the cosmic microwave background. We see a blue shift in one direction, and we see a red shift in the other direction. So you can kind of find our velocity with respect to kind of the center of mass of the universe that way. But that's not what Michelson and Morley were looking for. They weren't just looking for frequency shifts. They were looking for shifts in the speed of light, and that you do not see. Those cosmic microwave background photons are moving at exactly speed c relative to us, whether we are going kind of head on into them and we're seeing a blue shift from up ahead, or whether we're going away from you know their center of mass frame and you see a red shift as you look behind you. Yeah. Is that cosmic radiation background? Is that in all directions that we look at, or is that only in one specific quadrant? That space? comes from every direction. So we're we're in the history, like we're. The yes, the entire history. universe is based with this cosmic microwave background radiation, because where it comes from is, as far as we can, uh, you know, as far as our models tell us today, and uh, the, their this aspect of the models works pretty damn well. Where I mean, I know we will learn more about cosmology and more about the early universe, but I don't think it will turn out that what I'm about to tell you right now is is badly wrong. 
The universe, when it was about 100,000 years old, was filled with a plasma. The, you know, the, the universe has been expanding, and as it expands, that means you have less energy per unit volume, so you have a lower temperature. So back when the universe was younger, more compact, and much hotter, um, the main matter that makes up the universe is, and has been for a long time, hydrogen. The, um, this hydrogen gas wasn't neutral hydrogen atoms with a proton and an electron. They were ionized, because the universe was hot enough that in any collision, um, a hydrogen atom would lose its electron just from the kinetic energy of whatever it collided with. So the, universe, the matter of the universe consisted of protons and electrons, but they were, they were mixed together, but they were you know, moving separately. The electrons were not bound to the protons. It turns out that when you've got a, a gas as dense as the universe was back then, and it is ionized, that that gas is going to be opaque to light. So photons, and the reason I kept, instead of just saying the universe consisted of hydrogen, I said the matter in the universe consisted of hydrogen, because a lot of the energy in the universe back then was in the form of photons. But the photons would be bouncing around like balls in a pachinko machine out, off of all these uh, you know, free electrons and freely charged protons that they were interacting with. And so you couldn't look and see an image of some distant object because the light wouldn't stream transparently in a straight line to you. The light would be you know, bouncing around like this. So objects were giving off light, but e even if you existed at that point and you could uh, somehow stand these very high temperatures, vision would not be a thing because the light didn't travel in a straight line. The, um, at about the 100,000 year mark, this is when the universe had finally cooled off enough as it expanded that the protons and the electrons could capture one another and form neutral hydrogen atoms. And it turns out that at the density that the universe had at that moment, hydrogen plasma is opaque, but neutral hydrogen is transparent because neutral particles don't scatter light nearly as well as free particles do. So when the universe recombined, recombination is kind of a silly word for it because it was combining for the first time. But when these protons and electrons combined for the first time to make uh, neutral hydrogen atoms, the universe became transparent. And all those photons that had been ricocheting around like they were in a pachinko machine suddenly were able to stream freely. And whatever direction they happened to be going in after their last collision, that's the direction that they were then going in, well, for the next 13.7 billion years, most of them. The vast majority of the, of the photons that were around at that moment have never since then interacted with another piece of matter. The universe became that transparent. I mean, if it had, you know, it became that transparent and it was still expanding. So over time, the matter became more and more sparse and the probability of a collision for those photons kept going down and down and down. They can collide with matter. Hell, they can collide with our microwave telescopes. We turn a microwave telescope to the sky and we pick up these microwave photons. By the way, the reason they are now in the microwave wavelength is because um, back when they were first Back when recombination happened, these photons would mainly be in the visible to low ultraviolet range. But as the universe continued to expand, the photons redshifted. So they're now much lower energy. They're now microwave photons. But you turn a microwave telescope to the sky, and no matter what direction you look, because the whole universe was full of this, uh, this hydrogen plasma, so no matter what direction you look, you get microwave photons, and you are getting photons which right now happen to be having their first interaction with matter in the past 13.7 billion years. And that happened to be that they struck your microwave telescope. So uh, a cosmic microwave background is a pretty awesome thing when you think about what we're measuring there. And is there, is it, so the wavelength on a microwave, is that a meter? Or? Microwaves have a wavelength of about a one to 10 centimeters. So about a millimeter to 10 centimeters, let's say. Okay. Longer wavelength than that, they become radio waves. Not that anything physically changes about them other than that they've got a longer wavelength, but if we were talking to you in the distant future as the universe continues to expand and those photons redshift yet more, if we come back, say, in 100 billion years or something like that, we will talk about the cosmic <coughs> radio background instead of the microwave background. Yeah? If the universe was much smaller back then, uh, and the particles, the photons would start moving in one direction, would they, is, is the universe expanding faster than the light? The physical universe, okay, locally, no, 
nothing ever moves faster than the speed of light relative to its immediate surroundings. However, as the fabric of space stretches, you can actually say if you're measuring the distance between two distant points, the distance between them can be growing faster than the speed of light. And this does not violate special relativity because special relativity is kind of a local property. You'd say nothing can move relative to its surroundings faster than the speed of light. That is, you stretch the fabric of space time. Um, you know, if I stretch it, if I say, you know, if I have some stretched elastic membrane here, and I'm stretching it at 1% per second, well, if the membrane goes on to infinity, that 1% per second means the, dis you know, the distance between this point and some vastly different distant point is growing at an arbitrarily high rate. And that can be faster than the speed of light. That's, that, that's not actually a violation of special relativity because nothing's moving around on that membrane faster than the speed of light. But um, if the membrane is uniformly stretching, which is what we think the fabric of space time is doing, then yes, a distant enough point can be receiving from you at faster than the speed of light, or the distance between you can be growing at faster than the speed of light. That is actually kind of one way of thinking of what we call the cosmic horizon. There are points in the universe that are so distant from us that there is literally no way for us to have any information about what's happening there because in the amount of time that the universe has existed so far, light hasn't traveled that far. And an alternate way of thinking the same thing is those are points that are still received, that the distance between us is still growing at faster than C. Yes? I think this is why our nighttime sky is not full of stars. Yes, and that is a, so, you know, if you first say, well, why should the nighttime sky be full of stars? That is a separate paradox that actually goes back to Isaac Newton. Isaac Newton actually argued the universe must have a finite age because the nighttime sky is not full of stars. However, in order to, to answer the question, I first need to explain Newton's why, why it should have been. And let me call that the point when I should get back to, uh, to, to what we're talking about this week. I mean, the, the, this last week is kind of a, um, you know, a almost recreational physics where we, uh, where we learn a lot of cool new stuff and uh, it, uh, some but not all of it will appear on the exam. But let me not actually turn today into all cosmology all the time. Although that's a damn good question that you got there. But that also makes a good transition back to what we were doing here. All right. The... Um, I want to show you Maxwell's equations. I mean, we've alluded several times during this conversation this morning to the uh, the fact that, hey, Maxwell's equations, for example, tell you how fast a light wave should move. We haven't actually seen Maxwell's equations in all their glory. Now, in order to write Maxwell's equations as they should be written, I want to write them in the language of vector calculus. Now, a lot of you are taking 5C, to what extent have you um, studied divergences, gradients, and curls so far? I'm talking about Stokes and divergence kind of tomorrow. Oh, okay. So you're just getting to that now. Yeah. Are you using Stuart as your textbook? Yeah. Stuart sucks when it comes to explaining vector calculus. Yeah. I actually probably could have stopped that sentence after two words, <laughs> but especially when it comes to, to explaining vector calculus. Um, so I am going to give a crash course in what gradient, divergence, and curl actually mean. I hope for those of you who are studying it right now in uh, 5C that this will actually cast a little bit of light on it and, uh, and make it easier to, to understand from that point of view also. For those who have never taken 5C or for those who took 5C so far in the past that it's a, uh, a, a, a dim fading memory, um, no worries, I, uh, I'll kind of make this as self-contained as I can. Actually, before I erase everything on about the LRC circuits on here, I did, um, over the weekend, some people were looking at the, uh, the, the PLC on LRC circuits and were saying, okay, the, the fizzlets made good sense, some of the, uh, the long form questions made good sense. Some of them, it sounds like uh, the language Joe was using, or the language that whoever originally wrote the PLC was using, um, was, uh, was unfamiliar. So I wanted to actually, before we erase the LRC circuits, make a couple of points drawing together what we did on Friday to what is on that uh, PLC number 14. Yeah. Um, the the two that I was working with, though, he had, instead of cosine, he had sine, and then instead of adding the phase angle, he subtracted it, or if we were subtracting it, he added it. 
Uh, yes, he had the opposite convention we do for the phase angle, and he was using sine instead of cosine. Yeah. Both of those are things where every author you read for the rest of your life will do those things differently. So there's no uniform convention on those. So the important, you know, the important thing is, doesn't matter which author you're looking at, when we say things like, hey, for a capacitor, the voltage lags the current, that will always be true. Does the voltage lagging the current mean a phase angle of plus 90 degrees or a phase angle of minus 90 degrees? That varies from author to author. Frankly, I will tell you, feel free to ignore the question of is the phase angle positive or negative? It doesn't matter. However, you do want to be able to tell me, um, is the voltage leading the current or is the voltage lagging the current for this circuit? So if I'm looking at an LRC circuit, remember we talked last time about how if this green phaser represents the current running through that series circuit, then if I've got, and I actually erased my uh, diagram over there of the circuit itself, but it was just a standard LRC series circuit. And since it's a series circuit, the same current is running through all three of those elements. So as this green phaser rotates its way around this circle and we project out its real part and say that's the actual voltage at this moment, or that's the actual current, I'm sorry, at this moment, <coughs> then um, that, that current will be the same for all three elements. Which is why we said we were going to actually start by drawing the current phaser and work backwards to find the voltage phaser. In a way, I'm messing up the cause and effect, because you say, you know, the reason the current's running is because I applied a, a sinusoidal voltage with that source. But I'm gonna say, you know, instead of starting with the source voltage phaser and then working out everything from there, I'm gonna start with the current phaser and work my way backwards. Because for each of our three elements, I can easily draw a phaser for the voltage across just that element. The resistor, the voltage across the resistor at any moment is IR. And because that Ohm's law applies you know, instant by instant, at every instant the current through the resistor is the voltage across it over R, then the voltage phaser on, on the resistor is going to be perfectly in phase with the current phaser. When the current is the greatest, the voltage drop will also be the greatest. When the current hits zero, like it does when the phaser is pointing purely in the imaginary direction, the voltage drop across the resistor also hit zero. So those two phasers are oscillating together in phase with each other. On the other hand, the voltage phaser across the inductor and the voltage phaser across the capacitor are both 90 degrees out of phase with the current. Now, for each of them, if I wanted to know what's the amplitude of that voltage, how big is that voltage phaser compared to the current phaser, the answer is not bigger or smaller because I would be comparing things with different units. But if I said, hey, what's the ratio of kind of the length of that voltage phaser to the length of that current phaser? The answer there is always given by the reactance of the, um, of the element. So for the capacitor, the voltage drop will be 1 over omega c times the current through it. The amplitude of the voltage drop will be 1 over omega c. When I talk about reactants, I'm leaving out the phase information. But I could say over here, OK, the capacitor is also um, pi over 2 out of, out of phase. Which direction is out of phase? I have to put a positive sign there. But again, instead of thinking is the phase constant positive or negative, think in, uh, in actual physical terms for the capacitor. The current, the, the voltage lags the current by 90 degrees. So if the current phaser is rotating counterclockwise, the voltage phaser should be 90 degrees behind it. And the length of that voltage phaser is given by that impedance times the current. The inductor is just the other way around. The length again is given by the impedance times the current, but the, um, this time the voltage is oscillating 90 degrees ahead of the current. So these vectors oscillate together like this. And we were finding over here, if I add together those three voltage phasers, the first thing I can do is cancel these two against each other. So I will end up with kind of a out of phase voltage, which is just the difference between capacitive impedance times I naught and inductive impedance times I naught. Whichever one is greater, that'll be kind of the direction of that phaser. 
I've drawn it as if the capacitive impedance is greater at this moment. So if I add these two phasers together, I'm going to get this one, a shorter voltage phaser, but still pointing in that capacitive direction, still 90 degrees behind the, uh, the voltage. And then if I add to that the resistor's voltage phaser, I'm going to get the actual voltage phaser for all three of them put together. And hey, what's the voltage across all three of them combined? That's the same as the source voltage. So even though in real life we first apply the source voltage and because of that we get the current, the way we've kind of reasoned through this problem, we first drew the current phaser, and then after thinking through the consequences, we got the voltage phaser. Now, if I'm dialing the phase of this, uh, or if I'm dialing the frequency, I'm sorry, of this, uh, of this power source, as I change the frequency, what things on this diagram are going to change? The capacitor, the capacitor, and the inductive yeah. phaser. The capacitive impedance and the inductive impedance both depend on frequency. So if I turn the frequency up, which one of those impedances goes up? Uh, inductor. The inductor. If I go to higher frequency, the inductive impedance will get longer. If I go to higher frequency, the capacitive impedance will get shorter. Eventually, if I dial the frequency right, I could make those two equal to each other. What happens that's interesting at that point? What happens if those two impedances are equal? Is that resonance? Yeah, that's when I get resonance. That's when these two phasers perfectly cancel each other out, and the only impedance I've got left is the resistor. And that will also be when the voltage phaser looks as short as possible on this diagram, because that resistive phaser is still there, but I've canceled out that perpendicular component. Now, remember, if I fixed the voltage amplitude at, say, 100 volts, then when I say the voltage gets as short as possible, what that really means is compared to the voltage, the current is getting as long as possible. If I were to go to really high frequency, so at really high frequency, there's my resistive impedance, IR. I would have a huge inductive impedance and only a really tiny capacitive impedance. So my voltage would look like this. And for a moment, I might say, hey, that means V source must be huge at that moment. But wait, V source is actually staying the same. I'm leaving that power source at 100 volts. What that really means is I would rescale the whole thing. And I would say, oh yeah, I'm getting very little current at that moment. When am I going to get the most current? When I have canceled those two uh, phase shifted impedances, and when V source is just equal to IR, then if I rescale the whole thing, I'm getting the most current. So you hit resonance. You get the strongest current at the moment when these two impedances are equal. And we saw before, if I make those two impedances equal, I make 1 over omega c equal to omega l. That ends up solving for this. The natural frequency that an LC circuit likes to oscillate at, if you just give it some energy and you let it go, because we already figured out that was 1 over root LC, is also the resonant frequency. The way you make that circuit hit resonance is you tune, you know, you tune your power source to this frequency. Or you could say you tune it so that your capacitive and inductive impedances cancel each other. Now, how does this take you back to answering some of the questions on that PLC? Well, the first thing Joe was doing, he, he talked about positive and negative phase shifts. For now, I don't give a shit. We can, we can, we can set a sign convention. We can, we can even set the same sign convention that he does and figure out what he meant by positive and negative. But for now, I don't give a shit. However, if the voltage is lagging the current, or if the current is leading the voltage, then that means that which of those two impedances is dominating? The capacitive or the inductive? Capacitive. This is what we mean when we say a circuit is mainly capacitive at a given frequency. The capacitive impedance dominates. It kind of partly cancels out the inductive impedance, but then you've still got the equivalent of a capacitor in your circuit and you've got that phase lag. If I then said, what if I want to tune this circuit closer to resonance? 
If I want to tune it closer to resonance, what have I got to do? Increase the inductive impedance or increase the capacitive impedance? Increase inductive. Yeah, if it's capacitive right now, I need to increase the inductive impedance. In other words, if you've got a circuit that's acting capacitive, if the voltage is lagging the, the current, then if you want to bring it back toward inductance, you need to raise the frequency, because that will knock down that capacitive impedance, that will increase the inductive impedance. Hey, another way he put it is, when do you dissipate the most energy in your resistor? You tell me, when do you think you'll dissipate the most energy in your resistor? When you your resistor? In your resonance. Because um, energy dissipated in a resistor is just I squared R, so it doesn't depend on phase, it just depends on how much current's going through that resistor. When is the current the greatest? When you're at resonance. So if in the question he asks, hey, you know, if I wanted to increase the amount of, um, of power being dissipated in the resistor, what should I do to the frequency? He's asking you to bring the thing closer to resonance. So if right now it's acting, it's acting capacitive, you want to bring it closer to resonance? Increase the frequency, up that inductive impedance. If right now it's acting inductive, if the voltage is leading the current, and you want to bring it closer to resonance, decrease the frequency of that capacitive impedance, decrease the inductive impedance. So again, I really like a lot of those questions on that PLC. The things that I, yeah, I'm kind of consciously not even uh, giving an answer to because I want to steer you away from it is, is the phase constant positive or negative? Who gives a shit? That depends on whether the person wrote plus phi or minus phi in their equation. Yes, it's important if you're trying to get the equations right. But if you were to, you know, that sign convention lasts until you go and you read a different book with a different sign convention or until you uh, walk away and you forget what sign convention they used and you just propose one and said, here's the one I'm going to use. So what do I actually want you to know? I want you to know, you know, what leads what. So, um, Actually, on that PLC, any question where it asks, is the phase constant positive or negative? I'm going to tell you my canonical answer is it doesn't matter. Um, it matters, but, but it doesn't matter enough to, uh, to, uh, that, that I'm even going to uh, establish a convention here. But I am going to say, come hell or high water, you want to know kind of, you know, what lags what? You want to know the difference? What do we mean when we say a circuit is acting capacitive? We mean that capacitive impedance is greater. So when you cancel them, it acts like there's still a capacitor in the circuit. What do we mean that it's acting inductive? That inductive impedance is greater. When do you dissipate the most energy? When you bring those back toward equality, when you bring the whole thing back toward resonance. That should be enough to answer all but two of those questions. The two that I'm just going to say, don't even worry about, are the two where you have to actually know if the phase constant's positive or negative. I don't care. Yeah. For the frequency, um, all frequency except for the natural frequency, you'll replace it with the driving frequency. The driving frequency is the frequency of that source, exactly. So the, when I say you would increase the frequency or you would decrease the frequency, the frequency I'm talking about is the driving frequency. That, that source is oscillating at frequency omega, and that's what sets the capacitive and the inductive impedance. And then if that is true, then the frequency is known as the natural frequency? Yes. This particular frequency is the natural frequency, 1 over root LC. And if the driving frequency equals the natural frequency, that's when those two uh, out of phase impedances cancel, and that's when you, you hit resonance. You get the maximum possible current through that circuit. Yeah. I oh, just heard PLC two years. Is this PLC for uh, LRC circuits still due this week? Um, both PLCs are due any, finish them both this week, Evan. So, so that one and the uh, usual, here's a whole bunch of review questions for the exam. Again, on the whole bunch of review questions for the exam, Anything that goes into LRC circuits kind of in more mathematical grunginess than we've done, feel free. I'll, I'll, I'll go through it and I'll, I'll put a little note on the page telling you which ones, uh, which ones you can feel free to, uh, to ignore or downplay. Or at least say, if I were to ask you these questions on the exam, what I would ask you is what leads what. I, I, I would, not, uh, would not put it in terms of can you calculate the phase angle or, or whatnot like that. The, um, oh, speaking of um, 
PLCs. The other thing to do this week, make sure you have got your um, weekly times recorded for the whole semester. On Wednesday, I will actually uh, look through them before class and I will maybe bring down the sheets for anybody who, uh, who, who is not up to date. On Friday, I will do that more emphatically for anybody who was elsewhere on Wednesday or something like that. And on Monday, the day of the exam, if anybody still is not up to date on those things, because we got to turn them into the state, if anybody still is up, not up to date on those things, you cannot turn in your exam unless with that you turn in those, uh, those, those sheets to me. So the, uh, uh, we, we do need those. So if you, catch, if you get your whole semester recorded by Wednesday, that would be awesome. I will start nagging you at that point. And believe me, if I'm nagging you, it's nothing like the extent to which uh, uh, Joe and Carlos will be nagging me about the same thing. So. <laughs> All right, so vector calc. If I'm going to talk to you about div, grad, and curl, I want you to have a geometric sense for what each of these vector calc operators do. So your basic operator in vector calculus that we are going to be getting a lot of use out of is the gradient operator. We draw it like this, upside down delta with a vector sign over it. And it's got a vector sign because it is a vector. It's got x, y, and z components. So I'd say i hat times whatever its x component is, plus j hat times whatever its y component is, plus k hat times whatever its z component is, is the kind of general form for any vector. So when I put a vector sign over that, you'd say, hey, so far, what I've written here on the right should make perfect sense. This is how vectors work. Now, what is the x component of this operator? Well, it's not a number. It's not even a function of other things. It's an operator on function. What do I mean by an operator? Well, I mean this. The x component of the gradient is ddx. Not ddx of something, but just ddx, which means if I apply the gradient to some function, then this component is saying, take ddx of whatever you apply it to. I do think of this as kind of a geometric entity in itself but it's not going to spit out a number until I give it a function to, uh, to take the derivative of. The y component of the gradient operator is ddy. And the z component is ddz. Now, what can I do with this gradient operator? The simplest thing I can do with it is apply it to a scalar function. Now, what do I mean by a scalar function? In fact, you'll hear people talk about scalar fields and vector fields. Well, when they say field, they do just mean a function of position. So if I say a scalar field, I mean something that is a function of x, y, and z. So it's just a function of position. And the thing that I'm calculating as a function of position should be a scalar. I use as my example there temperature. Temperature's a scalar. Temperature doesn't point in any particular direction, it's just a number. So I could, if I were to write out a function telling you the temperature at various points in this room, that would be a good example of a scalar field. Now, what would happen if I took that gradient operator and I applied it to the temperature? Well, now I would get a actual vector where the three components yeah, would be actual numbers. What would the x component be? Well, if I um, multiply any vector by a scalar, you know how this works. So I take the velocity and I multiply by 3. I just triple all three components. If I take this gradient vector and I apply it to temperature, just all three components Got applied to the temperature. So when you, any place where you would multiply two things, if you were just uh, dealing with quantities, if one of your quantities is an operator, you apply the operator to whatever you're you're multiplying in on the right. So this would be i hat d t d x plus j hat d temperature d y plus k hat d temperature d z. So I started with temperature, which was a scalar field. What I got out is a vector field, because it's still a function of x, y, and z. This could be different values at every point x, y, z. But this time, the answer is a, um, a, a vector. As one example of a vector field, 
I could be, if I talk about the temperature of the air in this room at different points, maybe I also want to measure the velocity of the air in this room at different points. This time again, by field, all I mean is that it's a function of position. Vector field means, yeah, this time, if I plug in x, y, and z, what this function should give me is an actual 3D vector. So tell me the velocity of the air at that point. All right, so if I took the gradient of a scalar field, I got out a vector field. I'm not saying this is the same thing as velocity, but I'm saying, hey, a vector field can just be anything where at every point in space it gives me a different vector. Now, how do I geometrically interpret what happens when I take the gradient to temperature? I don't know. Suppose I want to measure the gradient at this point right here. I've got a mosquito who's flying at that point right there. And the mosquito, as insects go, is actually very mathematically interested. And the mosquito wants to calculate the, uh, the, the gradient of the temperature at that particular point. Well, what does that mean? Well, maybe I've got an ice cube sitting right here. And maybe I've also got a um, heating coil sitting over here. And the mosquitoes flying here. If I were to walk through the three derivatives that this thing tells me to take, if I were to take dt dx at this point, which direction do you think the temperature is probably rising in? Yeah, if I move to the right, the temperature is probably getting higher because I'm moving farther away from the ice cube and I'm moving closer to the heating coil. So dt dx is probably a positive number if I've got my x, y, and z coordinates set up like this, z can be pointing out of the page. So yeah, dt dx is probably pointing, or dt dx is probably positive. If I multiply that by i hat, that will give me a vector pointing in the positive x direction. Then what do I do? I take dt dy. So now my mosquito kind of imagines sampling points around here. Where do you, which way do you think the temperature is increasing on the y-axis? Can you move upward or can you move downward? Uh, you move Maybe it's just up or the right. Well, no, if I, these are partial derivatives. So these are saying you freeze one co coordinate while you think about the other. So on this first one, the mosquito was imagining freezing the x position, or freezing the y position, I'm sorry, while moving in the x direction, and said if I move to the right, the temperature will get warmer. This time, at that same position, you imagine freezing x for a moment, moving in the y direction. Which direction will the temperature probably get warmer? Upward, because you're moving farther away from that ice cube. So again, dt dy is probably a positive number. Maybe not as great as dt dx was. Maybe the ice cube's not uh, having as much of an influence on the surroundings, or maybe it's the fact that you're not moving directly away from the ice cube or whatever. But you'd say, okay, you know, this one might be a smaller derivative, but I would still get a positive number times the y component. And then I do the z-axis, but since the z-axis means out of the board, let's just say that if you move out of the board, well, if all this stuff is in the plane of the board, it might be that that particular location, the temperature is not changing at all. Now, there might be some curvature to it. It might be if you move far enough out of the board, you're getting so far away from those elements that if the heating element was dominating, now it's cooling off, or if the ice cube is dominating, now it's warming up or something. But again, that would be a curve at this particular point you're probably on the flat part of that curve, D. There's no reason to think that out of the board or into the board is the warmer region. So dt dz might be zero. So what's the overall gradient of the temperature at that point? It will be a vector that looks like this. I just add those components together. So that red vector might be the gradient of the temperature. Now, how would you interpret that? If you're now giving instructions to the mosquito, if the mosquito says, actually, it's kind of too hot in here, which way would you instruct the mosquito to fly? Opposite to gradient. The mosquito says it's too cold in here, which way would I fly most efficiently in order to you know, warm up? With the gradient. So the, you know, the geometric interpretation of the gradient is the direction means the direction of gradient t is whichever direction t increases the most rapidly. The sharpest increase. In that scalar. Why did I change most rapidly to sharpest? Well, most rapidly sounds like I'm talking about its change with respect to what? 
time. Time is a totally different variable in here. We haven't taken any time derivatives, but we're just saying at this particular moment in time, which spatial direction gives you the sharpest increase in t? That's what, you know, that's what the direction of this gradient tells you. What does the magnitude of that gradient tell you? Well, it tells you if you were to move in that particular direction, how much will t increase per distance moved, assuming you are moving in that most efficient direction. So in the direction of grad t. So it might be that at this moment, the uh, you tell the mosquito, yeah, grad t turns out to point 25 degrees above the horizontal. And I would get that just by doing some inverse trig on those components. And the magnitude of grad t is maybe five degrees Celsius per centimeter or whatever. So you're telling the mosquito, if you fly that way, you'll find the temperature increasing by five degrees for every centimeter that you fly. Now, the gradient can change from point to point, but it's saying, hey, right now, if you move one one zillionth of a centimeter, you should expect the temperature to go up by five one zillionths of a degree. Then you have to reevaluate the gradient at that new point and see if that, uh, if that situation is changing. So again, the gradient is a field. So at different points in space, it might be the fact it moved way out here, the gradient's almost zero, but it's still pointing back toward that heating coil. If I move in close to the heating coil, the gradient might be really strong and toward the heating coil. If I move close to the ice, the gradient might be really strong, but away from the ice cube in every direction. So again, applying that gradient at different points in space is gonna give me a vector field. It's gonna give me a set of vectors that fill all space, telling me, hey, depending where you are right now, what's the direction you could fly for maximum increase in the temperature? Okay, so there's kind of the physical meaning of gradient. The next thing you learn to do with that same, oh, and one way that you would apply this to electromagnetism is what is one scalar field that was important to us over the course of this class? Voltage. Voltage, exactly. E field and B fields are vector fields, but voltage is a scalar field. So what is the gradient of the voltage? Well, gradient of voltage would again mean it points in the direction where the voltage would increase the most rapidly. The strength of that vector tells you how rapidly the voltage increases. Um, what does it sound like I'm describing when I talk about it? Uh, yeah, I'm describing the E field, except that the E field points not in the direction of increase, but in the direction of most rapid decrease. So it's negative the gradient of the voltage. So there's one way that you apply the, um, the gradient to an electromagnetic situation. Now, what's the next game we can play with those vector op with that uh, gradient operator? Well, in the same way I can multiply a vector by a scalar, and way back in physics 11 or something like that, when you were first learning how vectors worked, one of the early things you learned how to do was multiply a vector by a scalar. You have a velocity vector, what's three times the velocity vector? Hey, I got this. I just multiply the x, y, and z components all by three. One of the next things you learned to do was take the dot product of two vectors. So if I take the dot product of a and b, then of course what that means, I take the x component of a times the x component of b, plus a y, b y, plus a z, b z. But what if I want to take the dot product of that gradient operator with something? First off, should I fill this second space with the name of a scalar field or the name of a vector field? Vector field. Yeah, I can't take the dot product of a vector with a <laughs> scalar, but I can take the dot product of two vectors. Oh man, terrible bad joke here. Um, what, what do you get when you cross a mosquito with a, a mountain climber? Um, Clingy dad? Nothing. You can't cross a vector with a scalar. Uh, oh. Uh, <laughs> okay. That was good. Right. So yeah, dot products and cross products both require me to, to you know combine two vectors. One would be the gradient operator. The other one here would be well the gradient of any vector field. I would take the x component of the grad operator times the x component of the vector field. And what do I mean when I say times? Well, if I take an operator times a function, it means you apply the operator to the function. So I would take the x component of the gradient operator, which is ddx, 
and I would apply it to the x component of the um, vector, which is a. Then I would add to that y component of the vector field, apply to the y or y component of the gradient, apply to the y component of the vector, plus z component of the gradient, apply to the z component of the vector field. All right. Now, what is that going to look like? What would that vector field A have to look like in order to spit out? Well, first off, did I just spit out a scalar or did I just spit out a vector? Scalar. I spit out a, a scalar. So when I take the gradient, or if I take the divergence, as they call it. So this whole operation is known as taking the divergence of A. You can only take the divergence of a vector field. You can't take the divergence of a scalar. What would A have to look like in order for the divergence to point in, say, the x direction? It'd have to be, it'd have to have an x component, but no y or z. Like, I'm trying to fool you. No. What would this vector field have to look like in order for the divergence to point in the x direction? Oh, it's just, it's the divergence is a scalar. It can't point in the x direction. <laughs> However, what would this vector field have to look like in order for the divergence to be positive? Well, there's probably a bunch of different vector fields I could draw that have positive divergences because the only um, possibilities are positive, negative, and zero. So, um, you know, it's not like there's only one vector field in the universe that has a positive divergence. But if I want to build myself a tailor-made vector field to show you what positive divergence looks like, I might say, hey, why don't I just start right here and say at this particular point, A is zero. Since the um, the Divergence is all about taking derivatives of A. It almost doesn't matter what I what constant I start with. But I might say, hey, at this particular point, A is zero. Now, if I want the divergence to come out positive.